Hello. Hey, would somebody uh, say something? I want to test something. Hello. I believe that's our speaker. Hello, speaker. Hey. And uh, those of you, except for Veronica, of course, who are on video, if you would please turn off your video, I think it'll save bandwidth. And, uh, well, no, but I guess uh, Veronica had actually asked me to have people leave video on, right? Hey, Veronica, um, uh, I'm not getting, I'm not hearing you. Veronica, I'm not. Admit. Oh. Um. Ver in the lower left hand corner or towards the center of the left most button. I think you might have to press that. Yeah, Veronica. Let's see. I'm going to pin. You might need to click on the video screen to make that window active. Whoops. Still no still no audio from you. Uh may, maybe um Yo, that that did something. Now I heard it. I was muted, actually, I don't know why. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not muted now. Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. Yes. Hey, hey Veronica. No, what I don't see is how to share a screen. If you um, you uh, it's on the lower right-hand corner. It's called Present Now. Oh, yeah, okay. There I go. Um, just a window. Well, I'll share the entire screen so you can see what I want to see. Okay, so. Uh, are you ready? I understand you know CHR, so I'm not going to detain myself a lot on that. This is going to be more than anything an interdisciplinary talk, uh, with the hope of motivating many of you to orient yourself whenever you can in your professions towards regenerative AI. And I'm going to explain in context what I mean by that. So, the computational requisites for AI to support going forward, bringing about the social changes that we need to, as a brilliant economist put it, Kate Lower, keep the human rights of all within the means of the planet. I think this, if you get anything from my talk, <laughs> and it's even borrowed, not mine, but it should be that as society, whatever we do in our profession, that should be our major goal, to meet the needs of all within the needs of the planet. And meeting the needs, for meeting the needs, we need to meet the human rights. So once I've convinced you of that, which I hope I will, I will show you how maybe CHR is adequate or AI in various forms is adequate for a task. So if you can move on from there and actually build it into your professional life. And I want to dedicate it to my dearest nephew and niece, Wilson Olivia Dow, in memory of her father, international lawyer Henry Dow, who all his life was fighting for social responsibility corporate social responsibility, defending workers from abuses from companies. Um, 
Well, and one of the works I'm going to talk about today uh, was inspired by this work. So it is a very fitting dedication. This is what we'll talk about. Four things. Why? What? What we need computationally, and in particular what AI tools are affected. For the motivation, well, we, I think we're all very aware of AI propitiating abuses. It's not abusive in itself, but the public, the public has largely funded it now. Hey, so hey Veronica, are you, you intending to be on slides now? Yes, I am not. You are not at the moment. Well, how do I do that? I, I press uh, you, you, the old screen, so... Uh, you uh, click present now in the lower right-hand corner. So you know what? I, I am clicking on share, and it's not doing anything. It says share your entire screen, which I clicked on. It says Chrome would like to share the contents of the screen with me to Google Chrome. Wait, choose what you'd like to share. Ah, maybe I have to choose. But how do I choose? Right. What a mystery. I love high tech. There is probably an option to scare, share your whole screen, which would be fine. Well, can't share your screen. Sorry, an error has occurred when screen sharing. Dismiss, let's try again. Present now. Share your entire screen. Chrome would like to share contents of your screen with me. Who will choose what you'd like to share? I'm clicking share. Uh, I, yes, <laughs> now, I, now I, I was getting it. Oh, okay. It says you're presenting to everyone. What do you see? It's okay now. Do you see my slides? No, yet. No. Not yet. Um. Well, they are on my screen. If you're seeing my screen, you should be seeing my slides. I can see your slides now. I can see it too. See PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Um, I have you pinned. Hold on. Um, I... I now have, I now see your PowerPoint. You're good. Okay, so I'm going to point everybody to see my PowerPoint. And uh, if you just make the window a little bit bigger, it might be easier to read. Yeah, if you, if you would maximize that window, that would be great. Let us um, play a concurrent slide. Oh, there you go. Yay! Yeah, we can see it perfectly. Okay, okay, so you missed this one, <laughs> but I really said it. And then we have this one, which shows the four things I'm going to talk about. Um, and I was at the first one, motivation. We all know about how AI is promoted, that our private information be taken without their consent, and all kinds of abuses. And moreover, they have funded the based on research that the public funded, so we should turn it to benefit of the public. Now, this has, has been happening, but recently we have also very rapid changes. For instance, people who used to be in favor of dismantling public health and going for the business of uh, disease instead are reprioritizing. <laughs> And changing their minds. Let's go for public health. So um, there are changes that were brought about inadvertently, like we can't travel anymore, so the air is cleaner. And uh, this is showing us that changes can occur. And maybe the mindset we had was a little bit inadequate. Now, to take advantage of this of this opportunity, we need absolutely international cooperation. If we do things right in one country but not in others, or we don't coordinate with others, it won't, have, won't work. So, what do we need for international cooperation the most? To my mind, 
information we can trust, which is reliable, which is verifiable, transparent. If it's coded, the code has to be accountable, explainable, questionable. And that's where I'm going with my talk. Now, it's inserted in society. So the emerging plan is for the safe and just place within a brilliant graphic depiction by Kate Rowland of where we are at and where we should be in all in one donut. <laughs> so within the emerging plan, the important thing is to keep in mind human rights and how both the lack of human rights and the abuse of human rights makes us all fall outside. Well, sorry sorry yeah. for interrupting, but it looks like you're still on the outline slide and I wanted to make sure that that's I where am, you yeah. wanted to be. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I am. And, uh, and now in part three, so for computational support, I'm going to go through the conditions I believe are needed in any computational support, which would be informational and programming, uh, that can support this emerging plan. Verifiable information, ethical protection, explainability, pertness, we go through all these. And then we go through why AI tools are effective, and in particular, CHR. So, this I already really said, so let's go to the next one, an emerging plan. Flipping our priorities. I don't know what those numbers are doing there, but okay. Uh, <laughs> so, what our priorities are, are largely unseen and inexplicit. They're just background normal, the normal. Right? <coughs> we have to, first of all, debunk the myths by which we die, because there are myths behind what we're doing. And there are many brilliant new economists showing up uh, dealing with these things, looking at the economy with a very brand new set of eyes and, uh, and uncovering, for instance, the difference between value and price, which is very fun to uh, myths about deficit, studying poverty alleviation and what we're going to do today mostly is look at donut economics by Kate Lowell. And crucial to being aware of the myths and finding them will be looking at the problem's sources. If we just look at the symptoms one by one and deal with them one by one, they mutate, but they never solve. It, we would be like a doctor treating somebody and not knowing the person has a, a deficit in uh, uh, general general in, in his entire body and we, we look at one symptom, cure it, and then it shows someone else. So this requires connecting the dots between human rights, their lack, and their abuse. And here's the donut. But if human rights are uh, all um, present for everybody, there are those li that are labeled in the inside of the donut. Water, food, health, education, income, work, peace, justice, political voice, social equity, gender equity, and so on. That's the social foundation. If we, any of us, lacks any of those things, we're falling inside the whole of the donut. So for everybody to be okay, we have to move into the green part, the meat of the donut, dough. That is a safe and just space for humanity, but there is also an ecological ceiling, which if we go beyond that ceiling, uh, we are also um, um, going against our own possibilities of survival, not only life in general in the Earth. And 
And those feelings are given by climate, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, and so on. So we all want to be in the donut and aiming at the donut, keeping all these constraints in mind, what we need as a social foundation and what we cannot exceed in terms of ecological seeing can help us focus on a regenerative and distributed AI and that can help inform policy makers and the public. But where are we now? This is where we are. It's all being quantified, it's coming from numbers. And the red things you see in the middle of the donut are the shortfalls. For instance, where we are worldwide in political voice, you can see that the lower rightish hand side is pretty red. And likewise, what you see red outside the donut is where we're going beyond limit of the planet. And you see climate change, nitrogen, and phosphorus loading, biodiversity loss, land conversion. Those are all in red. The blue are the ones that are not quantified. Like we know they're creating chemical pollution and air pollution. We just haven't, haven't quantified how much beyond the boundary we are going. So, to not fall out, we have to keep in mind uh, the rights of all, human rights. And in particular, Kate Rowell explained, we have to include explicitly all productive and distributed sectors of the economy. Because while we are excluding something, we're not realistic. If we don't include the Earth, which gives us life, and not respecting its boundaries, and eventually we run, we run out of what we need. We have to respect society, which is foundational, nurture its connections. The economy, and this is such a big um, part of the myth, it has four core systems, very diverse. We have to support all the systems. But the main system, the core economy, is not recognized. It doesn't enter the calculation of any world economy. Yet it produces the core goods for its members. And it even produces the next generation without which nothing else exists. But it is the only sector so unvalued that it's not even paid. To me, that is the reason why women are demoted into the second sex, is because um, they're not valued economically. Uh, the market is powerful, so let's embed it wisely. The commons create it, unleash their potential, and don't capture it as much as they're doing. The state is essential, so make it accountable. And then finance has the so it has to be serving society. Business has to be given purpose within the goal and not some myth mythical goal. Trade is double-edged, so make it fair. Power is pervasive, so contain its successes. If you have any questions, you can you can interrupt me, okay? I'm not seeing anybody, but I'll hear you. <laughs> I've I've also told them I've told them they can do that or or uh, uh, ask okay. questions on the Google or on our class uh, uh, Slack and I will forward them to. You. All right. Uh, all right. So one thing I want to say before we move about this uh, previous slide is that by putting everything clearly and exclusively. New solutions that didn't appear in when, we, when we were hiding things will appear possible. Like, for instance, we're talking a lot about basic income. Well, why not have a basic equity income, which starts by remunerating the unpaid and the underpaid? And then for a basic income, why don't we call it a basic re, re 
replicating income. And we get all the people who are unemployed, either through automation or COVID, to retrain. And those people who are working in destructive industries to retrain into regeneration and pay them a basic regenerating income. My little idea for today. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Veronica? Yes. Can I on, can you go back to the previous slide? I mean, many of these it it feels to me like I we all know these things, but uh, people have been trying to make states accountable for thousands of years. Uh, you know, since uh, uh, and the state always seems to push to not be accountable. Uh, and that's just yes, in, in all these sectors of society, except the ones exploited, um, and within each of the sectors exploited, there are abuses all the time, and that's the main problem. But, but the main, main problem that is the source of that is domination mentality. And that's been very studied by archaeologists and sociologists and systems theorists. And there's a great book by Rianne Eisler that explains it all, the origin of the idea of domination, and how it's so instilled in our minds that we accept it. And part of why we accept it is we learn it in our childhood. There's always somebody at home doing unpaid work for us, and our very life, lives depend on it. So we accept it as normal, because it is, right? Um, and that's where all the idea of domination comes from. And once you accept the idea of domination, it's a lot easier to fall into racism and all kinds of isms. Because you accepted the idea, you'd be inconsistent if you kept one living and tried and bloody murder towards the other one. You have to demolish them all. So we have to start by demolishing the very idea of domination. And informationally, if we can organize socially for using an information platform that could help us do that, this is a very good moment, a very opportune moment. We have a lot of opportunity to do it. I'm not saying I know how to do it or that we will do it or whatever, I'm saying I'm thinking of how to help. And I think that the main way to help is, first of all, to have it very clear what the goal is and what's getting in the way. What old thinking we have inherited from millenary domination by cis males, basically, uh, that are getting in the way of all the good ideas that have been going on through all this millennia anyway, to never get to a point where they, where they really produce equality and democracy and all the things we need. So I don't know, Anne, if that answers your question, but it's more or less the best way I can answer it. Okay. Um, why don't we go on? Okay. You can come back if you want. So computational requisites, what I'm thinking of is a platform that would be lodged mm -hmm. in some place like the United Nations or some, you know, very international organizational place that could have information and code to support all the actions needed. Of course, the information needs to be reliable, and in the case of uh, white and black information, like the temperature at which water boils, we would say this is absolutely true. And if there is a, a question of how true it is or a, a degree of reliability, we indicate it with the information and we indicate the sources. We'll see a little example program about today. Um, and that's the best we can do when we don't honestly don't know if it's 100% true. But at the very least, we can show the sources so people who may want 
to check why do I believe that, at least can check where did I get the idea from. And from there, go to other sources. Code has to be reliable too. If possible, it has to, to be sound, meaning all conclusions that it gets are conclusions that actually follow from what it knows. Um, okay, can I uh, again ask a question? Yes. Um, so, um, uh, I'm sure we, you've experienced trying to query, a, you know, large RDF databases and know that on any kind of scale, information is never reliable. Um, yes. And um, secondly, uh, uh, you know, for your code to be reliable, effectively, you are in a space like Psych or ConceptNet where you are uh, trying to uh, do common sense reasoning and uh, and that's pushing the state of the art. Well, that, sure. that's not pushing the state of the art, that's beyond the state of the art. Yes, yes, yes. You're totally in the right, and that's why I'm saying when not possible, <laughs> it has to be prudent. There are some pieces of code to which we're going to be able to say this is totally reliable, and that's all theoretical studies. When it's not possible, the function of a, of, a, of, a, of a system must have been sufficiently known, shown to work properly, and the consequences sufficiently understood to be bargaining to test through statistics of many, how many times it fails, etc. But um, it's important that it be possible to, to look at the code. If you can't look at the code because you have, for instance, statistically based programming, it will tell you something today with the data it can consult today on the web. And in one month, when it has gazillions of hours of more documents, it will say something different. So we need to know that the code is reliable, or at least we need to know that it's not reliable. And that difference should be very clearly made. We shouldn't be allowed. We we shouldn't be subjected to pieces of software that have so many bugs, like the machine answering system, like the, the phone answering system. They're using us as debuggers because their code is not sufficiently debugged. It does not work, so they're using our time for free to debug their systems. That's what I want to mean. I'm not. I don't want to say that. It is always possible to guarantee that whatever code you write will be reliable. What I'm saying is some code will be reliable, mark it as such. If it's not, make it explainable so that I can see, at least I can trace it, or I can get somebody knowledgeable to trace it. I can pay an expert to see why they deny me this credit, <laughs> rather than them telling me, oh, because the machine says so. That's where I'm going. Does that clarify enough, then? Yes. Well, explainability is great. Um, you know, all of my students have been uh, writing uh, uh, planners, and mm -hmm. uh, it's it's truly interesting to see. Quite often, they they come to me and they're puzzled. They can't get the program to work. And their prologue code with their, for their planner is working. What's broken is their set of actions. Um, it's, it's pretty hard to write the set of actions for a planner. Well, a planner is one of the most difficult problems. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. You know, and, and most of my students are using domains like make a sandwich. Uh -huh. um, uh, the actual domain is um, uh, make a simple bedtime story generator right. for children, and and uh, you know, and, and even that is hard. So I, I'm just questioning the feasibility. Surely. Of this. Yes, yes, surely. But for instance, let's take climate change. We can measure the CO two levels in rich countries. We can measure the CO two levels in poor countries. We can know, therefore, 
but the most of the well, most of the generation of CO2 occurs in the rich countries. So when the solution comes, okay, let's lower the CO2 level, maybe we should uh, look at the programs and, and make a, make a, run the possibilities. If we, if we do this measure or that measure or the other measure, okay, if we prohibit programmed obsolescence, in how much is CO2 going to decrease? And we won't know it for certain, 100%, but it would it would be a pretty good estimation. And that's what I mean by reliable code, because the code can say, if you reduce programmed obsolescence in the rich world, there'd be a reduction of X percent in CO2. Or that X percent would be between this and that range. And if you go through all the possible measures that exist to reduce CO2, like sequestration and all kinds of things, uh, then you can have a, some code that examines how to put a few together and what happens, which is these, which is those, which is the other. That's the kind of problem I'm thinking about. But in general, for any problem, the more you know about reliability, the better. What you don't want is fake news. Um, things that you can't verify guiding your life and making decisions for you in biased ways like statistics or oriented AI is doing increasingly. Face recognition is very biased, for instance, racially. That's the kind of thing we need to avoid. Now, once avoided, once the horrible things avoided, there's a space of code that's going to be totally reliable and a space that won't be 100% reliable. But if we have indicated the reliability of the information and how it combines when it, with the reliability information of other pieces of information in the code, we can have a little calculus of reliability associated and determine the reliability of conclusions of that. And when that's the best we can do, well, that's a lot better than what we're doing now. So if we think about having it as a goal, it will definitely be a big step. Yeah? I hear a silence. Is it agreement or Jane? Uh, should I continue or? Um, I, Joshua has a question in the chat. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, shall I just read it? Mm -hmm. That's a fascinating question. How do you keep the data reliable? But um, frequently market or business layers require opacity to maintain segregation. Intrinsically isn't veri verifiability at odds with aggregating scientific norms that are shared. It's a complex piece, but I don't have the answers to that because we would assume we have this entity I'm thinking of, which would have lots of people working in it, and with the areas. And some areas would have these problems that you mentioned. I don't know how to solve, but let's start by the ones we can solve, and then we would know how to maybe interact with the others. It's not. It's too general a talk to go down to that level of detail. But I do admit, I do recognize that this is not universally feasible for universal reliability of everything. But for the things that we can turn into reliable, we definitely have would have a lot of benefit in doing this. Particularly when we are within this goal of gathering and updating information as reliably as possible for as reliably as possible guiding the transformations we need. Not having that goal is making us go in every which direction. But computationally we can, if we, if we move under that umbrella of the overall goal, what we want to do is this. 
Let's go towards that direction. And then, you know, one reason I'm putting all this together is that we're doing the, the very opposite in many, many respects, although we know that we could do better. There is no ethical protection. We have no laws that say that the results of AI have to be used for the public that funded AI. We have no laws saying if something's not debugged sufficiently, don't subject the public to it. You can't use it. We don't have a law saying if you're going to make decisions on people's lives on the basis of code, the code should be explainable. You can't just tell the person no. The reply is no because the computer says so. And we're getting those replies all the time. More and more, we are unable to exercise our rights because of a, an informational dictatorship that's growing under our feet. But we're also about programming those things, so let's get on board in the other direction. So, um, question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, as symbolic systems grow in, in uh, complexity, think of large expert systems, uh, mm -hmm. they, they do reach a point at which their own explainability becomes um, lesson just because the explanation itself becomes pages and pages of yes. Yes. what l begins to look like log files. Yes, and that is why I'm proposing centering in AI languages like CHR, inferential in any case, because modularity is such that you can, from a tiny starting little program, which is totally modular and totally self-contained, completely debug it, be sure that it works, and only then call it from another little module that itself can be totally debugged and explained and so on. And if you work this way, you reach a very complex system that embeds inside it the capability of explaining itself. In each module, you have the possibility of, of printing the entire proof of how the conclusion was arrived at. So when you call it from the top most of a very complex system thus devised, and ask it to trace its reasoning, it'll come out. And so if you're in a legal procedure because somebody denied your rights because a computer said so, you can at least hire an expert if you don't know how to follow the code to follow that code and the expert will see, oh, okay, you know, I spent two days, maybe whatever, but it'll be possible. I spent two days looking at the code, and I found that this is why they demand your, your rights. And then you have a tool to go to court and defend yourself. But you can't defend yourself now when the computer says so, and that's all you know. If it were the law that before curtailing a, router, you know, a right of yours, they have to be able to explain why, then we will be coding everything so that it can explain why. And that's my main point. Is that a little clearer? <laughs> Still unconvincing? Well, I don't want to get into a long argument. Maybe you can we can leave the remaining questions to the end. Yeah, that but, that's fine. Yeah. I, I suggest you go on. I, I yeah. So accountability basically would be explainability. We need to give to either an, an expert that needs to be able to fully understand why conclusions are arrived at which involves transparency because without full access to a source code, 
you can't work, find how it worked. And there are issues, of course, like fairness, safety, privacy, um, pertinence. We have to not leave out factors that are relevant, relevantly pertinent to a theme. Um, flexible consultation, navigated on demand from different points of view. Um, and this is a big one too. Uh, some, if you are working with reliable, in, uh, non, non 100% verifiable information, you may reach contradictions. The program may reach contradictions from having two different contradicting sets of data. Uh, the important thing is not so much that you don't allow contradiction because finding a contradiction will allow you to reason further and find out more. But it should, they should be detectable and noted. And if you are carrying as you are, the degree of reliability of everything, you would find that in each of the reasonings that led to contradiction, and also the links to where the information came from. And then you can go trace it. So that's part of transparency. Dynamic organization involves allowing all sectors of society Within law, of course, some things will be confidential, I'm sure. But um, what I'm thinking here is instead of uh, having to agree on an, an entire platform every four years for a measure that may or may not, may not be even honored once the person wins, why don't we do actions around each theme? Sometimes we do those continuously, they're happening right now, but um, maybe we could coordinate, the system could help coordinate these actions and get worldwide participation, leading, for instance, to parliamentary petitions that would change the laws in a more synchronic way worldwide, uh, little by little and ineffectively, for instance. Let's suppose that we've determined, yeah, we're going to go through all, go through all these changes, but where, where is the money going to come from? Well, one of the myths is we, are, we have to tax only or mostly the workers. Very soon there will be none between COVID and automation. Um, so maybe somebody thinks of going back to the 60s, 60s levels of taxing of the rich, which are well, about 70%. Uh, well, that's maybe a measure that universally has a big, big majority behind it. But it will never happen country by country. It would require worldwide coordination and changing the the laws in every country. So that could be done at the same time if we did have a platform like this. Maybe I'm more too ambitious and too optimistic, but um, the thing is that we, we will need very, very creative and um, unheard of solutions for these things. Uh, diversity is crucial because uh, there has been studies about there have been studies about collective intelligence, and there's a striking result, which is a group is not intelligent. Uh, a group's intelligence collectively does not depend on the intelligence of individual members. So you can have an Einstein in a group, but that won't make it more intelligent. What will make it more intelligent is diversity. Having more women, more non-conforming, non-mainstream people, and that gives collective intelligence to the group, and giving them equal voice, uh, equal opportunities to express their ideas, and equal weight in their voices. That is what leads. 
between original thinking and collective intelligence. And in fact, it stands to reason because people who are forced to live outside the box are forced to think outside the box. If, if they are intelligent on top of that, and most of us are, <laughs> uh, it's a matter of developing intelligence in many cases. But um, of course, uh, the thinking will be out of the box, and we need solutions that are out of the box. And also those people who bring in diversity would be the ones that are sensitive or even aware of problems that mainstream people are not. So that I think is crucial among the people creating the solutions, creating the code, we need diversity. And finally, visualization would be really um, helpful because it can make information vivid and bring it a message clearly about for, in particular, policy makers and legislators. How do we choose the software tools? Well, AI is, of course, a natural candidate since we, we know that we're going to need inferential capability and we know we're going to need the conciseness in order to be able to explain and trace that uh, inferential tools give. But we have two big camps now on AI. The inferential crowd and the statistically based crowd. And in many cases this second brand of AI is not really even AI. It's what used to be called statistics which has been now giving given a, a new tool, which is big data. And it's been rebranded as AI. And this creates a few limitations that we have to be aware of before choosing tools. In the first place, AI is not as intelligent as is usually portrayed. I don't know if you're aware, there's a book about it. And there's an army of underpaid workers waiting to be called to save the day when, for instance, you order a pizza and the system doesn't understand. And you think it's this AI behind the machine that's getting you everything you want. No, it's relying crucially on a, literally an army of people who are, who are uh, underemployed, underpaid, unrecognized, with no benefits, and, and the making AI appear more intelligent than it is. Um, likewise, it is not as artificial as it is usually portrayed, because we have to remember that all the intelligence in these programs that are really so stupid that you forget a comma and they don't know what to do, is the intelligence of the programmers put in there. So, for, my, for, for all the learning between inverted commas, etc., um, really, it takes a lot of human curiosity. And, um, and lastly, if we look at statistically based AI, we can sum it up as saying that it favors popularity of an answer. You, you see it in your phones, you try to complete a word, it will complete it according to how most of the people out there are completing it. It doesn't understand a word of what you're saying. It doesn't try to create even a representation of your sentence that a human could read and make sense of. Nothing. It's just popularity content. So because AI is so statistically heavily based these days, is that non-transparency is so rampant because you can't ask a um, statistically based system, why, why did you say so? It won't have a reason, it will say, well, because the majority thought so. 
in order to drag us further drag more people so um, they favor popularity or reason justification and they moreover are guaranteed to catastrophically fail they're prone to catastrophic failure the only question being when will they catastrophically fail not whether they will so for that reason we have to use them i think sparely if at all but i think they do have their, their place in a project like this one so they're very good at counting for instance they could be aids in natural language processing if we, if we had it and get gazillions of documents and detect double speak for example uh, loaded word, words that have double meanings or that are, have been twisted to mean something else, like security. It could separate all the documents that mean security in the sense of being able to walk in the streets without fear of being raped, etc. Uh, security for citizens, that's one meaning, from another meaning of security, which almost means the opposite. It means uh, Let's build more nuclear arms so that we'll be secure. That's a, a little bit of a twist in the meaning, right? So we could use statistics to, for instance, go through documents and separate those that for which the meaning is this and those for which the meaning is that. But anyway, with all these considerations, we turn to inferential AI languages which base their conclusions on reasoning that is generally sound, but of course, once we program it, we are forced to take practical cuts that compromise soundness. So as long as we know, and we can have them open to examination. Among these, you've been studying CHR, yay! <laughs> and so I won't explain what you have in this transparency, except by showing you the example. Um, uh, roughly, this example has in the bottom line the query. The query initializes the constraints tor with two pieces of information that are taken to mean that the level of CO2 in Canada is 15, and if we end up planned obsolescence in Canada, it's, mis it's understood, uh, that would uh, reduce the level in 30%. So we've thrown in that into the initial constraints tour, and now we have a program which consists of one rule only. And that rule simply updates the level L into L1. It gets from the constraints tour, two things that match its left-hand side. They match it by L being 15 and A being N planned obsolescence and C being 30. They do a calculation of L1 as 30% in this case of L, and that will give the next level, which is thrown in the back to replace what was there. Well, most of the um, reasons why it's adequate for our requirement is the modularity. Modularity propitiates pertinence because we can add whatever we left out, modifying only the one thing, and that kind of propagates to everything else. We can consult it um, part by part. And that easy updatability gives a level of robustness. Uh, it's contradiction resilient because the results um, from marking, um, the results come with marks of reliability plus uh, the complete source that warrants the results. So it contradicts in conclusions that we arrived at, but would be fully examinable and questionable. And as a plus, they can deal with non-classical reasoning like abduction, 
which is unsound but very useful for diagnosing, um, CHR admits a very direct implementation of. And with that, we can reason with possible causes before deciding which one we're going to really go deep into. But of course, other software tools can complement CHR or even replace it. But for instance, visualization is a very good complement. Um, and I'm sure any, any other kind of coding Mm. Or any other kinds of coding can, can be used to complement. So one sample case. Uh, did you know that the opioid crisis in DC came because there was one single paper that the sellers of opioids made viral saying that opioids did not cause addiction? Now, the only little thing we didn't mention is that the number of subjects used for that research was very small, was unacceptably small for the research results to be considered reliable in any way. So before something gets accepted by doctors as being the reason why they're going to prescribe something, uh, we could have a system that, that uh, in general, for every medical area and every paper on it, uh, can mine from that paper the number of subjects, check what the minimum required subjects in that area is, and compare it with the number of subjects used in the study in order to alert the whole area, all the doctors, about this article not being trustworthy. Because doctors don't have the time to read all these papers and check. Too busy healing people. So this is a tiny little program, of course, but just to give you a feel of what kinds of applications I'm thinking of for AI in support of reasonable applications, regenerative applications. Another case is on responsible decision maker making. Did you know that when uh, thalidomide in the 60s made, uh, created births where thousands of people were born without arms and legs because of a drug that had been allowed in many, many countries? Well, there was one country that didn't allow it, and that was the USA, and it didn't allow it because of, of mistake, initially because of mistake, because the prof that accepted Francis Kelsey's application into grad studies didn't know the meaning of E versus I in the, in the name Francis, and thought she was a man. So he accepted her. <laughs> She accepted the position and went, and then a few years later became in charge, was a reviewer for the Food and Drug Administration, and had in charge accepting or not thalidomide. She said, no, no way, why not? Because it's been tested only on mice. And well, she was under enormous pressure. They went and they did all the tests again, they came back, and she said, no, again, why not? Well, because he's going to give it to women and he tested the wrong men. So we could have a system like that, or even more inclusive than just men, women, and children. Uh, and field by field, we could create inferential knowledge base that belong to all, and that's the other key thing. Any such platform must belong to the commons and be commons curated, created like like Wikipedia. You all contribute to it, but you all use it. No one's making millions for, from, from hiding the information or from twisting it, and it's very viable. We could do this field by field, and fake news and fake studies could be debunked in very viable ways.
uh, would be in a repository that everybody has access to. Corporate social responsibility. This is a system we actually uh, implemented and presented at an FCLP conference and at another conference that was um, sponsored by the Prince of Monaco, of all people. <laughs> I find that really funny. Um, it recommended the visions about investment, a very traditional application, not, not terribly revolutionary, but it did take into account users' goals and stated values. So the user could state what minimum desired return for the investment, 5% say, and what value for the human rights criteria. And of course, with this same technology, you can add more criteria. But once the user does that, if I did that and I stated 5% and max very high value for a human rights criterion, if I now query the system, should I invest on Dow Chemical? Maybe the, the system will tell me the following advice and give me a link for where it got it from, the link to Wikipedia. It would say, do not invest on Dow Chemical because according to Wikipedia, it sells chemicals that damage the human nervous system and have been banned from the US for that reason to third world countries that do not yet have protective regulations. So maybe I, I trust Wikipedia. Maybe I don't, but I can go to Wikipedia, see why it says so, what references it points to, and so on. I can unravel the, the mystery. Not present here. Okay. And here's the example where you get conflicting advice. You can get it. Because by consulting other sources, for instance, Dow Chemical's own website, we could have obtained the opposite advice. Do invest on Dow Chemical because it addresses many of the world's most challenging problems, such as the need for clean water, renewable energy, etc. So now what do we do? We have conflicting advice. Well, we have a choice. Are we going to believe? Who do we believe more? The references we can trace from Wikipedia, because we do have the link, or Dow Chemical's own opinion? And if you go to references, you will find that many of the lawsuits were lost by Dow Chemical because it has proved that it was harming humans in order to sell things that were banned elsewhere. So we allow an output, the possible contradicting advice and its rationale in each case. And with similar systems, we can conjure as much and as representative citizen participation as possible for decision making on, in particular, how to use AI for social benefit. Just keeping that goal in mind goes a long way. If we all keep it in, ever, in whatever profession we are. Well, these are code details that are really very important for you guys who are programming a lot more involved things. <laughs> but this is a general talk. This is how the user would define the values and the goals. And that's one sample knowledge base. Um, it's created in terms of constraints, CHR constraints that have five arguments, the criteria, the company, the rating, the reasons, and the URL of where it got those reasons from. Uh, and this is, well, the program that calculates if a company is okay or not. Taking the priority, the criterion, what the company achieved historically, because it's calculating possible um, benefit of the investment, prints the reason, blah, blah, and says that the company is okay. In conclusion, I'm into writing partnership societies away from domination societies. 
but how do we do it? The economy is kind of crucial, but it has to be embedded in a social context. Basically, we have to move from degenerative and hoarding into regenerative and redistributive. And I guess we all know that. Uh, what do we base it on? And we think this is very crucial. We can't continue thinking, for instance, that um, growth is our aim. Um, but even the myth that if we let growth continue unchecked, it will trickle down, all the advantages will trickle down to everybody because that's not happening. The inequality is bigger and bigger every time. So we have to base whatever we do on reality rather than me. Change our organization method from a force-based ranking, which is what we're based on now, to linking, to relation. If we're going to use any hierarchies, instead of them being arbitrary and forced, like they are now, they should be natural. For instance, it's natural that um, a, an, an expert in epidemiology has precedence in opinions on how to contain, contain a pandemic over a politician. That's a natural hierarchy. But the hierarchy that says, because you're a woman, your, your work isn't paid, or because you're a man, you get more salary and all the positions of power and decision that exist, or most of them, that's forced based ranking. And that we have to really get away from if we have any hope of, of change and, and of having our human rights met. So the mindset that we need to value life, nurturing, and creation more than domination, competition, and destruction, and show it. Put our value where our mouth is too. We, in other words, we have to rebalance all our society and governance fairly and peacefully away from the stereotypical cis-male dominance values, which, as has been studied, mm -hmm. if you have a book about it, uh, domination mindsets crucially depend on, because it's the place where we accept the idea of domination. And it's universally accepted. So we have to change that. And from that, we'll be able to undo all the other dominances. If we don't do it, we continue in the group containing the status quo, which is unnatural, with no value. How can we, from our professions, contribute? We can bring AI into service by participating in and promoting the numerous AI initiatives towards public societies that exist, cooperatives and all kinds of efforts, and demand the necessary changes. The necessary laws, and this is crucial, if we don't have laws to protect us, there's no way of enforcing them. But we can also create the AI systems that support those laws and interact with the legal profession whenever we can. All right, so that is my um, 26 cents worth <laughs> for the day. And I'll open it to questions. I've left you speechless. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you completely disagree or you're completely agreeing. <laughs> so you were talking about um, this system that would uh, explain whether or not to invest or not invest in Dow Chemical. Does something like that exist today? I don't know. Uh, the system we implemented was uh, an experimental system like we do in research, 
it wasn't part of a contract, which we, we also did sometimes, but it wasn't part of a contract that whose product was going to go into a place where it was going to be used. It was just the support, the the proof of of, um, of idea, proof of concept of the article. So I don't know. So I guess the, the reason why I ask is I I learn better from seeing an example, like a full example, and just wondering if there's a place that I can go and look for that. Yeah, I'm afraid we'll have to do it ourselves. But but the reason I say I don't know is that I, of course I cannot know. <laughs> if there is one that I don't know about, I don't want to say no. We absolutely don't have it, but I don't think we have it. Okay, thanks. If no one has questions, I want answers. <laughs> <laughs> and did my okay. argument convince you, or do you have still questions <laughs> about what you were asking about? Uh, well, I have a I have a research suggestion for you. Yes, please. Um, uh, it might be a useful experiment to try building um, a set of, uh, uh, we might say, ethics for a simpler world. Um, and I think of even uh, games like World of Warcraft, uh, uh, that kind of mul massive multiplayer online game. Uh, those things eventually, in the world, uh, they do kind of evolve uh, norms of behavior. Uh -huh. And, uh, and um, uh, yeah, in fact, do you know, um, there was the blood plague. Um, in World of Warcraft, uh, there was a programming error and some plague that was only supposed to happen in a certain constrained area as part of some quest got out and was everywhere in the system so they had this plague going on <laughs> and eventually I don't know any of those plays I'm unfortunately not a player I have never had time to play <laughs> yeah I well, programs on computers but um, I, I'll have a look at that that sounds interesting I, I just those kinds of um, those kinds of systems often have a much more constrained set of what can go on, and might yeah. be a more tractable laboratory for you. I have uh, okay. I have a look. Thank you. One thing I wanted to say that I think is very important is that there are countries that already are changing the goal from growth to to happiness. And, and there is a municipality that was Amsterdam who has maybe a month ago adopted the goals of Kate Rowan. And they have her in a committee working with, with them, with the municipality. And I think that organizationally, that's how we will have to proceed. We we'll have to ha go from municipality to municipality. One wonderful idea that I got from a, a book by George Monbiot called Out of the Wreckage. I think it was that book. If it wasn't that one, it was uh, Joyce Nelson's The Undystopia. One of those two books talks about a charter of municipal rights. If in each of our cities we can work with the municipality, to develop a charter of municipal rights, that can percolate to provinces, countries, the world. And if in each one municipality we do what Amsterdam is doing now and adopt explicitly key forwards goals and put them in a charter of rights, then let's say, for instance, we, 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 the municipality of Vancouver decrees that we will have municipal banks 
And when we need to give loans, we ask for a loan from, I don't know, the Bank of Canada, but not the private banks who charge us interest. If it's in our municipal rights that we have a right to do that, well, we just do that. And then other municipalities would go, hey, that's a great idea. Let's create the regenerative jobs, jobs we need in this municipality and give those jobs to the presently unemployed. And what they produce will be paying the loan, but to the municipality, not to a 19% interest credit card company or <laughs> whatever. Um, hey, Warner has a comment here. Um, yes. Uh, the big four have much more data than the researchers. How do you want to build evidence-based systems with that imbalance of information availability? Well, it will take changing laws, but I don't know. The imbalance is really very problematic because having most of our, of our wealth concentrated in 1% of hands means that the power is outstanding being weighing against us. <laughs> so it is a very difficult problem. I, I don't pretend I have the magic wand for it. All I say is that when a problem seems impossible, but it's crucial to solve it, we have to try. And in my life's experience, by having Naturally, I have that, that absolute need that when something is fair, even if it seems impossible, I have to go for it. And I'd be the first surprised sometimes about battles I fought that were losing one and that won. They surprised me. So my position is always do what's fair and right and go for it. And in the aim of, in, in the road of aiming at the impossible, even if you don't reach it, very good things will happen on the way. And you'll be paying the way for it to become possible for some regeneration. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm coming from personal experience, personal principle, personal uh, mandate. <laughs> Personal compulsion, call it. <laughs> I grew up in a military dictatorship, and I'm very worried about what I'm seeing. So I think the more that we start, start thinking about these things, we had paramilitary people killing us in the streets routinely, and I'm looking at how the police is becoming a paramilitary force everywhere. Officially, they're being equipped as armies in countries where doctors can't be equipped as doctors, like I, I read recently. That's our priority. Those are the priorities of domination mentality. We've got to get them in. And more and more people who are, like in, in the racist incidents that are happening now, People that honestly weren't racist, they didn't conceive themselves as racist, are now acquiring consciousness of the fact that even if they don't want to call themselves racists, they were prejudiced. And they're finding that, yeah, they had friends that were black, but they never imagined what those black friends went through. And the friends didn't tell them what they went through because it was second nature to them. Same thing with women. We don't tell men how much we suffer and they don't imagine sometimes honestly. Of course there are those that profit from the privilege. But I think consciousness is evolving and the extreme situations we are living in now are forcing those of us who are well-meaning but didn't have enough consciousness to rethink these things. So the more we help everybody rethink them, the more we embed them 
we we make them ours and we we live them, we enact them in everything we do in life. The more chances we have that the next generation will survive and thrive. And I for one am all into the next generation surviving and thriving. <laughs> there is no other possibility I will admit. I have a question. Um, given the emphasis that you placed on modularity, um, what do you think like a minimum viable product or example or, or test might be, like that first module? What do you think a good candidate might be? That's a question to you or anyone else who's here. You mean in terms of theme or in terms of programming form? An application, like a okay. domain, maybe. Okay. <laughs> I've got one, yeah. I was thinking, yes, every day I, I wake up with one or two or three ideas that I have to write and I never get to them. But um, something happened in Argentina that recently set me thinking about the following. Until we have equal representation of women in all levels of decision-making and power, we will continue to be treated as property of men and the domination mentality will never go away. And I'm thinking of this because um, in Argentina a 16-year-old girl was raped by six men for all three, because the fiscal said that it had been a rape, it had been sexual alleviation of these people. Can you imagine? Who are the manifestation of the popular revolts a la Floyd, where women are concerned and where non cis people are concerned? They're being killed like flies. Femicide is at, at unheard levels because they're forced to be indoors, and so many people are locked in with their aggressors. And I'm thinking, how do we get 50% 50, 50 representation of that 50% that's not represented? How do we get proportional representation of everybody into a position of power? Because only that can really, really, really change things. Because they're the only ones, like blacks know that their problems, women know their problems, non cis people know their problems, trans people know their problems, everybody knows their problems, but it's hard if they're not represented to even include them. Even if you make an effort to. So how about starting municipality by municipality and making databases and alert systems that would tell every level of government of female candidates in every position we're seeking places in. Like, for instance, in Argentina, there was a photo of 17 men with the man president in a meeting that he had called of everybody, or all um, of the main businesses, the main companies in the country, asking for ideas and help about COVID. The idea is great, let's do that. But do you have to have only men? 17 men on the land president in one room, representing only men. You know, only cis men, I'm sure, too. Uh, it's self-defeating. You are, it's like telling your body, listen, your right-hand side of your brain is not good enough. Let's only use the left-hand side. How would that body work? We need to all be 
represented in only positions of power. So any informational system that would get, for instance, the, if, if, the, if Argentina had had already that informational system, the president of the, and they have a ministry of, the, of, I don't know what it's called, women's issues or equality, equity, I don't know what it's called, but that ministry could alert if she had a database of all the names of the people that need to be represented. And whenever a meeting is called, they would say, okay, Mr. President, here's the list of proportional represented candidates to the meeting. And if we do that job by job, opportunity by opportunity, everywhere, so so uh, uh, that it could percolate. So making an all-male panel would cause the system to fail and backtrack? Um, sorry? I say, I say, so making an all-male system would uh, or an all-male panel would cause the system to fail and backtrack. Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> no, no, I'm not talking about how the I'm not talking about the system enforcement. I'm talking about there being a system that allows meetings to become proportional representative, representing and little by little also all positions of power. And I'm saying this because I remember sitting at a committee in university where we were looking for a VP academic, I think, and all the candidates that had put themselves forward were men. And there were only two women in the committee. And we sat and said, how do we get more women to apply? Because we knew the problem wasn't that there weren't enough women good candidates. It was that they didn't even think of applying because they were so overwhelmed with the double duty they loaded it in a, an environment whose load is already thought by to be undertaken by a carefree man with a wife uh, ironing his shirts for him. So we had a tremendous load in the university and a double duty load at home. Who would even think of noticing that there was a position they could apply to? So we searched, we went to all the list of all the departments, all the, all the women that could be good candidates. We approached them one by one. One of them replied, and she won. If we hadn't done that by our own initiative, it would have been a man, for sure. Because there were no other candidates. And so I'm thinking, instead of women being left to getting that idea on their own and promoting it on their own, there should be a diversity system that would promote promotion, would promote proportional representation of everybody, and even maybe more representation of intersectional minorities, because those are doubly bounded by prejudice and, and uh, discrimination, and, and, and they know a lot more about what they are subjected to than anybody can imagine. So if we, if the system lent support by keeping a database with possible candidates for, for all these jobs, and then alerted the possible candidates in each of the uh, oppressed groups, hey, there's an opportunity for you, apply. And they would then still have to go through hurdles, because I remember after that woman, we got her to say yes to applying. She was subjected to incredible treatment in the meeting that interviewed her. One of the men in the committee told her, Oh, you're in the start of your career, so aren't you afraid that if you go into an administrative position, your research will suffer? It was such a patronizing block on her road to put. And she said, I don't even know if I want to continue the search after. <laughs> I would have said something like, I don't know, I don't know if I want to continue in such an environment that treats me such so patronizingly after. 
I think it um, could also be interesting to give political candidates um, a report card uh, for different students, like in that university interview situation. Like if interview, if people who did interviews um, filled out a questionnaire about how they were treated and then the different identities they have, um, they would list like on an optional basis and they could list whether the like identity of the minority is uh, visible or invisible. Um, and then people's promotions uh, could be contingent upon that kind of demographic breakdown um, of how they're evaluated by people of different demographics. Um, and then also with the example of the politicians in Argentina, and if politicians at the end of honestly like each week um, had to were given a report card according to who they met with and, and if they only met if like 95 percent of uh, the time they spend is it just men and um, if that information were public i think that could be very valuable yeah the more we collect information about the invisibilized groups the more we approach equity, because then people will know and we need to do something about it. But laws have to support it too, which could be laws mandating those databases to be made available to people who make decisions about hiring in municipalities at all levels of everything. So that's what it can come in. And for it to be really effective, I think one of the big problems currently with how demographics are contained is, um, like in the United States, for instance, in general, if you're doing a survey, there's no place to indicate if you have to be either a man or a woman. Um, <laughs> you can't be intersex, you can't be trans, you can't be gender queer. Um, you can be either black or white, but if you're um, Hispanic and uh, a black Dominican, like where do you circle that? Um, so I think also the categories need to be more inclusive and more fill in the blank rather than check the book because that is the last is already written correctly. So. Yes, there is a lot to do and a lot of good ideas. Thank you. Uh, you know, perhaps this is a good moment, to, a good good message to end on. There is a lot to do, be done. Okay, well, thank you. This has thank been you. wonderful. Thank you for all your attention and questions and ideas. <laughs> Have a lovely time. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay.